This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Partnership. Uh, principally, partnership is, is applicable to UK, so through the UK or really English law, um, because Scottish partnerships are slightly different. So we're looking at partnership now. Uh, and the definition of a partnership is the relationship that subsists between two or more people carrying on business in common with a view to profit. Now that definition is really very carefully sorted out because every phrase within that definition is crucial that it should be complied with in order that the relationship should be classed as a partnership. Um, whether you want to or not, I'm going to go into partnership with you. So you and I are now in partnership, um, only for a limited period, I hasten to say. So where it's a relationship between you and I, you and me, it's a relationship between the two of us, um, and it subsists, that is, it still does exist. It's not a, a, something from history which no longer exists. It still subsists. The relationship that subsists between two, that's you and me, or more, we could have other people involved as well, two or more people, carrying on, that is, we are continuing to operate within business activities, carry on business in common, with a view to profit. It's no good you selling boats and me carrying on an accountancy practice with that's not business in common. So you're selling boats and I'm selling boats, then we may be viewed as being carrying on business in common. Um, you're an accountant, I'm an accountant, and we operate an accountancy service. You operate to your clients, I operate to mine, but we're carrying on business in common. And it may be, I'll later explain it, may be that this is viewed as a partnership. So carrying on business in common with a view to profit, we may not be very good at this. It may be that although we're trying to sell boats, you've only ever sold one rubber dinghy, and I've only ever sold a, a little boat that goes into a bath with a child. So we may not be very good at selling boats, but we do intend to make a profit, and that's important. So here we are, so defined as the relationship which subsists between two or more people carrying on business in common with a view to profit. And much of present day law is based on the Partnership Act 1890, 120 plus years ago. The Victorian lawyer legislature decided that we needed a, a piece of statute, a piece of legislation covering the concept of a business organization where two or more people carrying on business in common with a view to profit and it was covered by the partnership act of 1890. but this is important and i shall say this on more than one occasion and during this next half hour or so partners may agree to do anything they want so long as it's legal they can agree anything so long as it's legal it must be being carried on, no more than there for a one-off transaction. It must be a continuing thing. It must be with a view to profit, more than simply sharing of gross revenues. We're trying to, not just revenues, you sell something, I share, so sell something. Well, you account for half of that as your revenue, and I'll account for half of it as my revenue. No, that's not sharing profits. We need to share profits, so it's the... Revenue, less all the expenses, there's a profit. You take your share, I take my share. That would be partnership. If the business relationship does exist and it does satisfy the definition, the courts may well determine that a partnership exists, even though you and I may not have agreed to be in partnership, even though we may never have even thought about being in partnership. If the business that you're carrying on, the business that I carry on, and we're carrying on in common, and we're aiming to make a profit and we're sharing profits. If we're doing that, then the court may say, ah, you know, you're in profit, you two. You're sorry, you're in partnership, you two. And as a result of that, uh, then partnership rules apply. As a general rule, 
Partners are jointly and severally liable for partnership debts. A partner is an agent of the firm and their partners for the purpose of the business of the firm. The acts of every partner carried out in the firm's business bind the firm and the partners. So if I carry out an act on behalf of the firm, and as a result of that action, substantial losses are incurred, it's not me that has to stand those losses. It's you and the other partners. We're all of us liable, jointly and severally liable for the losses that are incurred by me and by you and by all these others that are members of our firm. So this is something to remember. Before you go into partnership with anyone, just be careful who it is that you choose as your partner. Because if they're reckless, careless, not bothering, if they're big gamblers, if they go into transactions not doing any risk analysis and as a result substantial losses are incurred, you are liable not just for your share of those losses. If these other partners of yours are all bankrupt, you are liable for the whole of that loss, right down to the value of your private assets. Your, your chalet in Switzerland has to go. You have to sell it. Your timeshare in Morocco must be sold. Your luxury yacht in the Mediterranean has to be sold. All your wife's jewellery or your husband's extra cars, all of it has to go. So be careful who you're going to partnership with. The acts of every partner done in the course of the firm's business bind the firm and the partners. Unless the partner is exceeding his authority. And if he was exceeding his authority, you're still liable. Because if the other party didn't know of that excess, then you're liable. But if the other party did know, then only that contracting partner is liable. Or, if I enter a contract with another party and this other party doesn't know that you and I are in partnership then you are, and I exceed my authority, then you can escape liability. But otherwise, the acts of every partner done in the course of the firm's business bind the firm and the partners. Unless the partner is exceeding his authority and the other party knew, or all reasonably to have known. Or wasn't unaware that this unauthorised person was a partner in a partnership. The agreement. Partnerships are formed by agreement. Internal arrangements are a matter for agreement amongst the partners. Remember, we can agree to do anything, so long as it's legal. A partnership is formed by agreement is capable of being amended or altered or cancelled by agreement. Terminated by agreement, therefore. But I've not mentioned anything about that agreement, that agreement having to be in writing, have I? There's nothing in there that, that I've said that says, and the agreement must be in writing, must be witnessed and signed by all the people to know. There's no requirement for a partnership agreement to be in writing. You and I can enter into a partnership now just by saying, let's be partners. Let's, let's operate a stand at the next careers exhibition in, in your local city, an ACCA stand at the local careers exhibition in your exhibition hall. So it's on for two weeks. And you and I will stand there day in, day out. Well, we'll take it probably in turns. And you stand there one day and, and sell the idea of ACCA and sell some ACCA products. Sell open tuition notes, except they're free. Give open tuition notes out. We could do that just as an oral agreement. We could carry on a firm of accountants. Just orally agreeing. 
And here's something to get your teeth into. If you're operating as an accountant bookkeeper, and I'm operating as an accountant bookkeeper, and we're conducting ourselves as though we were in partnership. We don't have to say anything to each other. We don't have to talk, nothing in writing. But if at the end of the year, you come to me with a, a payment order and says, uh, that's half of my profits, and I give you half of my profits. If we conduct ourselves as though we were in partnership, then if our relationship should ever come to court, the court may decide that we have conducted ourselves and therefore it is a partnership. Partnership by conduct is an agreement by conduct. Doesn't have to be in writing. Doesn't even have to be spoken. We can conduct ourselves and the court may say, yep, yeah, this is a, a partnership by conduct. There's an expression in the UK that says, An oral contract is not worth the paper it's written on. It's an oral contract, it's not written on any paper. Exactly. It's not it's not written on any paper and therefore it's not worth anything because it's not worth the paper it's written on. So an oral contract very difficult to prove, very difficult to establish. And so you'd ideally, if you ever do choose to go into partnership, you'll ideally make sure it's in writing and that it's been drawn up by somebody with a legal background, somebody who has experience in drawing up partnership agreements. Anyway, let's move on. You and I are in partnership. Typical matters, typical matters that we should agree on before we go into partnership are listed here, and I'll talk about them. But remember, we can agree anything, so long as it's legal. When I was a student, exams, accountancy exams, were always held in huge hall in Manchester, a big building in Manchester called the Cooperative Insurance Society. The CIA used to be called the CIS building. And then on the first floor of the CIS building, an enormous hall with row and row upon column upon column of desks and thousands of students in there. And the CIS building was a scene of my, I suppose, my greatest triumphs of passing my accountancy exams. You'll know the feeling. Any of you who've done F6 already will know that there is a, a, a sort of tax called capital gains tax, abbreviated to CGT. And if you were to add the Cooperative Insurance Society's capital gains tax, you would finish up with a mnemonic for typical contents of a partnership agreement, stuff that we should agree upon before we go into partnership or stuff that we should agree upon and hopefully put it in writing. And remember, we can agree to do anything so long as it's legal. Accounts and audit. If we're in an agreement, partnership, and you're not doing anything. We've agreed that you're not doing anything and that I'm doing everything. I'm doing all the work, I provide all the capital. And at the end of the day, we share the profits. This is what happened with me and my former wife. We were in a partnership, not in writing, we were both accountants. And she was bringing up children. But while she was bringing up children, we were wasting her personal tax allowance. So what we agreed was we'd create a partnership. I would do all the work, she would take 99% of the profits. Perfectly legal. But you and I are in agreement, in an agreement, and you're not doing any of the work, I'm doing it all. But we're going to share profits, you're not going to get 99, trust me. But even if you were only getting 40, how would you know that I wasn't cheating you? Of course I wouldn't, but how would you know that? 
Well, a partnership is not required to have an audit, but it might be in your interests because you're dependent upon my honesty that the partnership records, the partnership accounting records should be audited. So we'll agree. Yeah, I'll keep the accounts, I'll maintain the accounting records. And at the end of the year, we'll get an independent auditor in to look at them just to confirm that you're getting your rightful 40% share. Division of profits and also the sharing of losses. Well, me and my former wife agreed this, she'd get 99%. I'd only get 1%. That's what we agreed, legal. Sharing of losses, that's unusual, isn't it? Because a partnership is the relationship that subsists between two or more people carrying on business in common with a view to profit. So what's all this about sharing of losses? Well, if, sadly, we should be carrying on business and one year we don't do well and a loss is sustained, then we need to know how to allocate that loss. And we would normally allocate it on the same basis as we'd been dividing profits. So in that situation, we need to agree 40-60 profit share or 99 to 1 with my former wife. And the sharing of losses would normally be in that same ratio. Drawings, if you've done F3, you would know about sole proprietors and, and their drawings. Sole proprietors don't take a, are not an expense of their business. They may take money out by way of salary, but in fact it's not a salary, it's not an expense, it's an appropriation of profits. And similarly, when we have drawings, I've put in capital, you put capital into our firm, but I need to live. I need to provide money to the local supermarket in order to get food to feed the family. So I need to draw money out of the firm's resources in order to buy my monthly groceries. Well, those drawings, there should be a limit on this because if I put in a lot of money by way of capital and you put in some as well, and we're carrying on business and I'm working away and you're not, and I'm making profits and you're not, I need to be able to have some money out of that firm in advance of being credited with my share of profits. And those are called drawings. Well, there ought to be a limit because otherwise I find that you have drawn more money than I'm making profits. And that way lies disaster. So we need to establish the limit that either of us may draw monthly, quarterly, annually, that either of us can draw in advance of being credited with our share of profits. The capital of the firm. I'll put in 10,000. How much are you going to put in? Can I, can I put you down for 2,000? Okay, so I've got 10,000 and you've got 2,000. And that's the capital. That's the, that's the money that we use to start up our partnership. Well, we've agreed that that's what we'll have. You can put more in if you want. From time to time, you may want to add more, just further capital introduced. But that's the capital of the firm and the respective contributions. The capital of the firm is 12, and the respective contributions are 10 and 2. Fine. Interest. <laughs> Look, I put in five times more capital than you. Do you not think it would be fair when we're slicing up the profit cake do you not think it would be fair, those are the profits, for me to get a slice of that profit five times greater than your slice, which is interest? It's not an expense. It's a way, it's a title that we give to a particular element of the profits when we're sharing profits. These are appropriations of profits. They are not an expense. We get down to net profit, and then we say interest on capital. Mike gets 500, you get 100, so that's 600 of those profits, 8,000 profit. 600 has gone by way of interest payment. So interest payable, and interest not only payable on capital, but how much we're going to charge on overdrawn current gas. If you've drawn out money through the year before you get your share of, your share of profits, 
Are we going to charge you on that overdrawn current account? We need to agree. Salaries. I'm doing all the work, you're doing nothing. What about me getting some salary before we share the rest of this problem? What about me getting that salary? Comes off here. Mike, salary. Salary for Mike. 800. Yeah, will you agree that? So that leaves 6,600 profits available to be shared between us. So salaries of profits, partners, before profits are shared. But then we've agreed the division of profits, and those are profits, and we've agreed that it's going to be 40-60. 40 for you, 60 for me. And 40% of 6,600 is uh, 2640. So 2640 for you. And 60% of that is um, 3960, and there's our 6,600 profit allocated between us. So interest, that we made 8,000 profit. And of that 8,000 profit, I have received 500 plus 800 plus 3,960. 30, that's uh, 5,260 for Mike. And you... You've not done much at all, have you? got 100 interest and 2640, that's 2740, and there's the 8,000 profit. So of that 8,000 profit, although I'm only entitled to 60% of the profit, I've got these preferential allocations of salary and interest. And you've got a little bit of interest as well. So that's how that works. But we need to agree. Salaries are partners before profits are shared. Current accounts. Are we going to have two current? Are we going to have two accounts? Are we going to have? Sorry, let me come back. Are we going to have a Mike Capital account and a Mike Current account, and a U Capital account and a U Current account? Is that what we're going to do? Is that how we're going to operate it? So if each of us got two accounts. And here, we'll put in my capital contribution. What did we say? My capital contribution is 10. And, and that's fixed capital. And we'll not change that. Not until either one of us leaves or somebody new comes in or we add more capital in. That's fixed. Those are our fixed capital accounts. In here, we've got Mike. We've got interest of 500. We've got his salary of 800. We've got his profit share of whatever it was, 3960. And there I've got my drawings. Money that I've taken out through the year. You're the same. Drawings, you've got interest of 100. You've got profit share of, what was yours, 2,640. And, and so we have a record, a daily record, a monthly record of how much the firm hopefully owes you and how much it owes me in our current accounts. Or we could just have one account. The Mike account and the U account. I just put everything in there. All the capital, capital, I can't remember the figures, 500, 800, 3960. Okay. So we could do it just in the one account. There's no need for us to have two. But we can agree. We can agree whatever we want. As long as it's legal. <coughs> Back to the notes. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Sorry. Goodwill. We started our partnership about 15 minutes ago. You and I. And we spent the last 15 minutes building up the reputation of the firm. And that reputation is worth something. But the value of the reputation is not reflected within the accounting records. It's an intangible, non current asset. <coughs> Unrecognized. But when I leave, I want my efforts to be recognised. My recognition is through this intangible, non-current, unrecognised asset, goodwill. There has to be. It doesn't have to be. We can agree anything, as long as it's legal. But there should be. 
some way of calculating, computing the amount of this intangible non-recognized asset <coughs> that is attributable to me and therefore how much is attributable to your efforts. And we can agree anything. We can say it should be two-fifths of the average profits of the last five years before depreciation. We can agree anything, any formula for the calculation of goodwill. But we should have some formula, because otherwise there's nothing. Time period. Unusual. PricewaterhouseCoopers don't have a time period for their partnership. No, PricewaterhouseCoopers set up a partnership that shall last for 30 years, at the end of 30 years the partnership should. No, they don't do that. But you and I could. If we've got this stall at the careers exhibition, our partnership would last maybe for just <coughs> two weeks. It's a joint venture. A joint venture <coughs> is a partnership for a limited period of time. If there's no fixed time period, it's called a partnership at will. And a partnership at will is capable of being dissolved by any partner giving notice to all the others of their intention to dissolve the firm. That's a partnership at will. We're in a partnership, you and me. We've discussed it, so it's oral. Oh, no, let's write it down. So we write it down, the terms of the agreement. But there's some things that we didn't even think about. Like at the end of the year, I say, well, what about all this work I've been doing? Can I have a salary? We haven't previously discussed it. We've not previously written it down. We haven't anticipated this matter arising. And now we're in dispute. Because I say, can I have a salary? And you say, no. Oh, please, no. But I've done all this work, no. We need some way without going to court, because that's expensive. We need some way of resolving this dispute. And the way we resolve it is we go back to the 1890 Partnership Act. <clears throat> it's like a default category. It's got 11 matters that would normally be the case and will be the case unless we've agreed differently. We can agree anything, so long as it's legal. But if there's something arises and we haven't agreed, We've not discussed it, then we'll look at the default position as set out in the Partnership Act 1890. It's principally, you don't need to know this, but it's principally section 24 of the Partnership Act 1890, section 29 and section 30 also have one element each, but this has got nine pieces in it. But you don't need to know section numbers because they're not necessary, they won't be examined. In the event the partners fail to make an agreement, an arrangement, <coughs> and then that arrangement, that, that matter occurs, we can agree. Can I have a salary? Yes. We can agree to change the agreement. Can I have a salary? No. Oh, oh, oh. no. So let's see what the 1890 Act says. And it's here. <clears throat> when we established the firm, I could have said, look, you have no experience at all. Leave this to me. I'll do it. I'll look after the books of account. I'll put in the capital. I'll do all the work. You stay out of it. Don't you go thinking that you can go meeting clients. You stay out of it. And we agree that you shall not be involved in management. But if we've not discussed that at all, and you say, I want to take part, I've got a holiday, I've got two weeks holiday from work, I want to take part in the management of this partnership. And I say, no, you can't. And you say, yes, you, you want to. Let's go to the 1890 Act. And the 1890 Act says, every partner can take part in the management of the firm. We well, can agree differently, but unless we have, you're entitled. Equality. Equality of sharing profits. 
<coughs> and that also means equality in the division of losses. Ah, but the partnership definition says with a view to profit. Yeah, with a view to profit. But what happens if we don't make profits? Equality of profit share. At the moment, you're in a 40 60 share. My wife, former wife, was 99 to 1. If you and I don't agree, then the 1890 Act says 50 50. Or if there are four of us, 25 25 25 25. That's the default category, the default position. Derived benefit. Where a partner derives some benefit as a result of my use, if I derive some benefit as a result of my use without consent, my use of partnership assets, and you find out that I've had this benefit from using these assets without your consent, then I must account to the firm for all the profits, that all the benefits that I have derived from that wrongful use by me of those partnership assets. Indemnity. An indemnity is like a guarantee. I'm in the office one Saturday, doing a bit of extra time. There was a knock, a knock on the partnership door, and I open the door in the office, and in come two men with guns and masks, and say, give us the money. Don't have any money. The partnership doesn't keep any money in the, in the offices. Well, give us your own money. So I give them everything that I've got, which is not much, but I give them everything I've got. And then they say, <clears throat> we're going to come back next weekend and we're going to smash everything up unless you give us your Rolex watch. Go well, here, take the watch. And you promise not to come back next week, and they, they do. So you come in on Monday, and I say, what time do you call this? Because I've no longer got a watch on. And anything necessarily done by me to incur a personal expense or incur a liability in anything necessarily done to protect the firm or its property, you will contribute your share to my losses. You will indemnify me against this personal liability that I have incurred. You will indemnify me and make sure that you contribute to these expenses that I have incurred protecting the firm or its property. That's indemnity. And that's what partnership act. We could agree differently. <laughs> if Mike incurs any expense in anything necessarily done to protect the firm or its property, we agree that none of us will be liable. We could agree that. That's unlikely. Competing, very much like a derived benefit. If I carry on or you carry on a competing business, not using assets, but carrying on a competing business without consent, then you will account for and pay over to the, pro the firm all the profits derived by you from that competing business. Salaries, <clears throat> no automatic entitlement. No automatic entitlement. We can agree differently, but no automatic entitlement. I want a salary. No, let's have a look at the 1898. Uh, no. No automatic entitlement. Sorry, Mike, no salary. Interest, not payable on capital. I paid in all this 10 and you paid in two. No interest. Not chargeable on overdrawn current accounts. So you've drawn more than we agreed and I haven't. Sorry, you've drawn more than your share of profits. So now you're overdrawn. No interest. We can agree differently, but if we don't, no interest. But... <coughs> Interest at the rate of 5% per annum on loans and advances made to the firm over and above agreed fixed capital is payable. According to the 1898, interest at the rate, can you see a rhythm here? Interest at the rate of 5% per annum on loans and advances made to the firm over and above agreed fixed capital. You say to me one day, Mike, we're running out of cash. Can you lend the firm some money? Yeah, here you are. Here's another 3,000. Interest at the rate of 5% per annum. Loans and advances made to the firm 
over and above the agreed fixed capital. We'd have a third account for me then, wouldn't we? We'd have my capital account, my current account, and my loan account. And that loan account, that would be a partnership expense. Interest on that loan would be a partnership expense. Would it? No. It would be an appropriation. It would still be an appropriation of profits. So credit, cash, <coughs> debit, profit and loss account, appropriation, profit and loss appropriation account. This is not a separate bullet point. It's part of on loans and advances made to the firm over and above for Greetrix Capital. All right. <clears throat> Monday morning, I come in and, ha <laughs> you're going to like this. I wanted to meet someone. Are you ready? Come on in, come on. And in walks my son. Mohican hairstyle, green. Green Mohican hairstyle. He's got studs through his eyes, through his nose. Got a ring through his nose now. Studs everywhere, covered in tattoos. A distressed t-shirt and jeans. And I say, this is our new partner. And you say, no. No new person may be introduced without unanimous consent. If you don't want my son in all his finery, in all his glory, then I can't introduce him as a partner. I can bring him in as an employee, <clears throat> but I can't bring him in as a partner. We can agree differently. We can agree that any partner has the opportunity, the right to introduce one new person each year if we want, but otherwise no new person may be introduced. Books of account, available for inspection anytime, any partner. Self-explanatory. Expulsion, <coughs> three of us in partnership, you, me and someone else. And you two want to get rid of me. So you call the partners meeting and say, my partners meeting, the resolution is to vote you out and expel you as a partner. All those in favour, you vote in favour, she votes in favour. For it to work, I must also vote in favour, which is stupid. We can agree differently. We say a simple majority of partner votes can get rid of a partner. But in the absence of an agreement, no majority can expel a partner. What would you do? Dissolve a partnership. Partnership at will. Notice it's here by a given partnership will be dissolved at the end of this month. And then you and she set up again as partners. So it's not the end of the world. It's not a disaster. You, you can get around it. But no majority can expel. And finally, <clears throat> disputes concerning the firm's business settled by ordinary majority. You two want to um, open a branch office uh, in the second city in our country. And I say, no, 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 let's not do that. But two vote in favour, one against branch office is opened. But when PricewaterhouseCoopers decide that they no longer want to operate as accountants and auditors, then they want instead to be lumberjacks in the far northwest of Canada, chopping down trees for a living. That's a pretty radical change in partnership business and the nature of the firm's business. And no change to that firm's business may be achieved, may be, may be done without unanimous consent. So if one of you Partners in PricewaterhouseCoopers say, no, I don't want to go to the far north of Canada. Then dissolve the firm partnership and set up again PricewaterhouseCoopers tree cutters and go off to Canada. Disputes concerning the business of the firm settled by a simple majority. But any change in the nature of the firm's business requires unanimous consent.